course, the title of this one is A Conversation with Past and Current Gender and Society Editors. I'm really, really excited to be here and to see all of you here, um, all our past and current editors of um, Esther, um, Gender and Society. Um, I'd like to, first of all, take this opportunity to thank the Program Planning Committee for putting this amazing conference together. They've worked so hard and very appreciative. Mary Beth Staup is our chair of the Program Planning Committee, Sasha Drummond Lewis, um, Solange Simos, Barrett, Katuna, Natasha, Santana, Christelle, I always forget Christelle's last name, and myself. Um, so this plenary forms part of our initial celebrations, marking our 50th anniversary as a professional organization. And of course, gender and society has been part and parcel of the development of SWS. And, it's, and definitely its subscription and sales has made a lot of things that we've been able to accomplish possible. Um, gender and Society, I know you'll talk about that more, but I just wanted to touch and say, um, was established in 1987. And in terms of the impact metrics, it ranks at um, 2.742 at the impact factor. It ranks second out of Women's Studies Journal. It ranks 16th out of um, Sociology Journals. It's social um, Total citations, 5,437 and its article influence score is 1.808. And of course, the journal has also worked very hard over the years to create a very a diverse editorial board, and um, we're very pleased about that. So on behalf of the 50th anniversary committee, um, who are Judith Lorba, Pam Roby, Marlies Jew, Bandana Pokaesa, Jamie Hartless, Shaniqua Simpson, Barrett Katuna, Min Young Moore and I serving as co-chairs. We would like to welcome all of the panelists and thank you for participating. We look forward to all you have to share with us today and of course to the questions and answers following. And thanks also to the audience who are here with us today. And um, I'll hand over to you, Chris, and thank you for moderating the session. You're welcome, Josephine. Thank you for that really nice introduction. Um, I want to start by telling people, audience and editors, what we had agreed on as the format. We're going to allow ourselves about seven or eight minutes per editor, and then have at least a half an hour left for discussion, uh, since we managed to start in a more timely fashion than I imagined, which is great. Um, in theory, what we're supposed to be addressing is how gender and society paved the way or created space for feminist research. What were the many contributions of gender and society to feminist discussions and the discipline? And anything else I suppose we want to include. My introductions of each editor, since I did my own research on this rather than asking all of you to give me introductions, are relatively brief and refer to only some of each editor's many successes. So I assume I left out something important about each one of you, and you should feel free to add that information to my introduction if there's something that I have left out. So we're going to go through not in uh, our speakers, not in the order that they're listed in the program, but rather in the order of their editorial term. And the reason we're doing that is it seems a better way to show the cumulative impact of gender and society over time. So uh, with keeping that in mind, we're going to start with our founding editor, Judith Lorber, who is Professor Emerita of Sociology and Women's Studies at the Graduate Center and Brooklyn College, CUNY. And she was editor from 1987 to, two, excuse me, not 2000, <laughs> 1990. Uh, Judith was also president of SWS. She's chaired the ASA Sex and Gender section and received the Jesse Bernard Award, among many other honors. She is author or co-author of many books, among them Women Physicians, Paradoxes of Gender, Gender and the Social Construction of Illness, Breaking the Bowls, Gender Inequality, Feminist Theories and Politics, and Gendered Bodies, Feminist Perspectives. She's also editor or co-editor of many other volumes, and she has lectured all over the world. I was gonna list the places, but it was too lengthy. 
and she's been a resident or Fulbright scholar in multiple countries as well. If I tell you about all her other successes, I'm going to use up all her time, so I don't want to do that, and I'm going to turn the session over to Dr. Judith Barber. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Um, now, I unmuted myself, so can I? Okay. Penryn Society was established in 1987 to fill a niche. Signs, a journal of women in culture and society, had started in 1975 and was eclectic regarding social science and cultural studies at the beginning, but it was more and more focusing on culture rather than on society. Sex Scrolls, also established in 1975, published mostly small group psychology studies. It called itself a journal of research. There was also a lot of work being published in different journals devoted to women's studies, research on women, by women, for women, from a women's standpoint. What was missing was a sociological perspective and a way of conceptualizing gender as societal, not just individual. The intent was for gender and society to be a sociology of gender journal with a feminist theoretical perspective. This innovation was turned down by ASA, their argument being that ASA journals already publish sociology of gender articles but they were mostly quantitative, comparing women versus men on various parameters scattered over many journals and atheoretical. As editor, I was determined to be theoretical, which meant to define gender and to analyze gender's relationship with society. I saw my mission as bringing the new feminist perspective of the social construction of gender to sociological research and theory. My vision was spelt out in my initial from the editor, volume one, number one. Our focus, to quote, our focus is the social aspect of gender, which we see not as an additional variable or categorical factor, but one of the foundations of every existing social order. In this perspective, women and men are not automatically compared. Rather, gender categories themselves the question, and the situational and institutional processes that construct gender are the focus of analysis. As editor, I look for articles with a social structural perspective. Quite openly, I wanted to transform the field of gender studies to make it sociological and in turn to encourage sociologists to use gender as part of social structural research and analysis. My initial emphasis on social structure and the mandate I proposed was challenged by sociologists working in a more psychological mode. So I made sure to indicate the scope of what I saw as sociological. To quote, this perspective, which I have called social structural, does not concentrate only on macro structures but analyzes the interplay of the social psychological and social structural on different units of analysis, including the internal life of the individual. Coincidentally, the first article in the first issue was Barbara Reisman's Intimate Relationships from a Microsocial, Microstructural Perspective, Men Who Mother. The second controversy of the early years was over language use. By the second issue, I had established usage that distinguished gender from sex and sexuality. As I wrote in my editor's introduction, some readers will have noticed that gender, gendered, and gender roles are used in this journal rather than sex, sex type, sex roles, and women and men rather than females and males. This style has been deliberately chosen to indicate that our focus is gender as a social construction rather than a biological manifestation like sex. Where sex is used, it connotes a biological or physiological category. Most authors allow these editorial changes 
and the style was established. Having a vision could not have produced a transformational journal without articles that were similarly framed. Because gender and society existed, I received articles that used feminist sociological theory. And when they didn't, I asked authors to frame their research theoretically. In the process, sociological gender theory got elaborated. The second issue published West and Zimmerman's now famous doing gender. It had been rejected by journals for 10 years. Gender and society was the ideal place for it. And as editor, I was able to recognize its theoretical significance. I also established the practice of publishing the feminist lecture every year, which added to the stream of groundbreaking articles. I looked for articles that had a theoretical framework or policy issue that illuminated or advanced critical thinking that presented original research or analytic reviews of recent research that demonstrated good research design and sound methodology. Where these qualities were nascent, my reviewers and I spelt out ways they could be elaborated. And I think these criteria made gender and society prestigious and its quality, uh, both of which have lasted. In September 1988, the second year, I published a special issue to honor Jessie Bernan on her 85th birthday with appreciations by Muriel Cantor and Jean Lipman Blumen. Suggested by Muriel, the articles and book reviews in the issue reflected Jessie's interests and perspectives. One of them was Denise Candioti's Bargaining with Patriarchy, now another classic. I received a wonderful thank you letter from Jessie, now framed on my study wall, that started, I love it, I love it, I love it. In December 1989, the third year, I published the first special issue, Violence Against Women, guest edited by Pauline Bart, Patricia Miller, Eileen Moran, and Elizabeth Ann Spanko. It included research articles, articles on praxis, a play, poems, and a review essay. Building on that issue, Pauline Bart and Eileen Moran published a gender and society reader, Violence Against Women, The Bloody Footprints. The second special issue, Women and Development in the Third World, with guest editors Enna acosta Belen and Christine Bose, was published in September 1990. It too resulted in the book, Women in the Latin American Development Process, edited by Bose and acosta Belen. In my farewell issue, December 1990, I summed up what I felt I had accomplished in the four years of my editorship. First and foremost, I had redefined gender from a dichotomous variable to genders, changeable relational social status, social status is integral to a social order and a system of domination and subordination, the class structure, the division of labor in the family and the economy and the production of knowledge. Doing gender was the underlying social process which constructed and maintained genders. Second, gender and society established linguistic usage that distinguished gender from sex and sexuality, but did not lose sight of the power imbalances in the terms man and woman. I also noted the persistence of the gender binary and radical possibilities of those who behave in gender inappropriate ways have reflected in many of the articles published in those early years and subsequently. Thus, in critically examining feminist methodologies, gender and society raised the question of whether women doing research on women created a distinctive methodology based on women's standpoints and what happens when other localities such as race, ethnicity, social class, education, occupation, religion, and sexual orientation, intersect gender. Other recurring topics were the ways that production and reproduction, family and work, market-based and care-based jobs, 
resulted in women's inequality in modern industrial societies. Gender in society began to uh, explore men as a gender, publishing work by shapers of the field of men's studies, Kimmel, Mester, and Connell. I was able to publish articles on Asian American and chicane of feminism. But while racial issues were an integral part of many articles during my editorship, I regret that they weren't more specifically focusing on black feminism. I believe that gender and society sowed seeds of change that influenced feminist sociological scholarship. What I have been most proud of is that my vision of a new way of looking at gender was reflected in what was published in Gender and Society, and that what was published in Gender and Society has transformed gender studies throughout academia. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. That was great. Uh, for people who have, um, I guess for everybody but Barbara who can see me, I'm gonna hold up a little sign that says you have one minute left. Uh, or So if you see me holding a yellow thing up in your in a corner box, that means you're, you're running out of time. Um, then our next editor is Margaret Anderson, Professor Emerita of Africana Studies and the Edward F. and Elizabeth Goodman Rosenberg Professor of Sociology at the University of Delaware. Maggie was the second editor from 1991 to 1995. She was also vice president of the ASA and received the Jesse Bernard Award. She has been instrumental as well in the support of the ASA Minority Fellowship Program. Quoting from um, the ASA on, her, on uh, Maggie's Bernard Award, they, uh, Maggie's sociological publications can be read as a systematic engagement of gender with ideas about race and class. Publications such as uh, Black, uh, excuse me, Women's Studies, Black Studies, Learning from Our Common Pasts, Moving Our Minds, Studying Women of Color and Reconstructing Sociology, Studying Across Difference, Race, Class, Gender, and the Social Construction of Knowledge, and the Fiction of Diversity Without Oppression, Race, Ethnicity, Identity, and Power, illustrate her longstanding commitment to what is now known as the field of race, gender, excuse me, race, class, and gender studies, probably now if it were written more recently, it would say intersectionality. Uh, furthermore, her book, Thinking About Women, Sociological Perspectives on Sex and Gender, is now in its 10th edition. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome Maggie here and to have her talk about her editorship. Welcome, Maggie. There. Better. Better. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, and wow, lucky me to have uh, followed Judith's editorship when I took over Gender and Society. Um, I started this, as you said, in March 1991, although all of you know the transition begins much earlier than your first issue. And for me, unbeknownst to me, I was appointed vice provost at the University of Delaware just as my term as editor was beginning. So. That at first was daunting, but it allowed me to keep up with really fabulous and current scholarship on the sociology of gender uh, and have some better resources. To give a little perspective on this, and I'll say more about it in a minute, in the transition between Judith and myself, we still ship big boxes of all kinds of paper around. Um, and so Judith and uh, Susan showed up in Delaware with gigantic boxes that were stored in the uh, little office that we had. And I'll, I'll say more about that in a minute because for the uh, current scholars, you might find it a little surprising how some of that took place. But I do have to say I was really fortunate to have followed Judith's editorship because of just as she said, she established gender as a social construction, not just a variable or a biological fact. Uh, and her focus on that throughout her years as an editor and her focus on theory really laid the groundwork from all of what has followed with gender in society. So what I did was I went back and perused the table of contents for the five years I was editor. 
was a little bit nostalgic, I have to admit. And I couldn't help but think about how many of the then just fantastic senior scholars who established this field, sadly, may be very unknown to many of the younger scholars in our discipline today. And so there was a very personal feel to my looking at this. I did just what Judith did. So many classic articles published during not only her editorship, but also mine. Um, and so many important mothers and some fathers um, who really laid the groundwork in these early years. So one of the things Judith did that I continued to do was to write these from the editor comments at the start of every issue. Um, and I said in my first, and I'm quoting here, that I hoped to increase the analysis of race, class, gender, and sexuality. And I noted that it was the, quote, task of feminist scholars to explore the connections between simultaneous systems of lived experience and to see the different ways that gender is manifested depending on one's location in this, what we would now call intersectional system. And I asked authors when they submitted papers to maximize their inclusive vision when they were uh, submitting papers to gender and society. Uh, you know, this was all happening at a time when studies of what's now called intersectionality were blossoming, not only in sociology, but also in other fields. There was a huge renaissance of writing by Black and Latina women. Um, so to reflect that pledge that I made, we did have two special issues during my editorship. One was a special issue on race, class, and gender, edited by Doris Wilkinson, Wilkerson, Maxine Bakazin, and Esther Chow. And like some of the earlier ones, that special issue also resulted in a book. We also published a special issue edited by Beth Schneider, who's right with us now, Sexual Identities, Sexual Communities. And there's a small problem in the um, online SAGE uh, listings because Beth's editorship is actually not listed there. Um, but I know she did it. And honestly, I can't remember, maybe she can tell us later, if that too resulted in a book. If not a book, that special issue certainly laid much of the groundwork for the important studies we now have on the social construction of sexualities. So I would said I would talk just a bit about some of the technical phenomena of editing gender and society, because I think this perspective on the production of knowledge is also important. I noted in my last column in the journal that over the five years of my editorship, we received 1,000 papers and we reviewed all but four of them because gender and society had a principle from the beginning that all articles submitted would be rejected unless there was some extreme circumstance. The other thing was that we did most everything on paper. Letters of request to reviewers, uh, all manuscripts were in paper, mailed. Uh, thank you notes to reviewers and others were mailed and typed. <laughs> So when I look back on those days, I just remember stacks of paper everywhere. When we did the gender and society budget, it was on one little piece of paper, probably done as a word table. And so my, how things have changed. It was during my editorship that we went to six issues per year. With some trepidation, I must admit, because the turnaround to issues was then very rapid and resulted in a lot of speed up. And I don't have the data any longer, but I do remember that we had a pledge to make decisions very quick, as did Judith. And I'm pretty certain we were good to that um, goal. You also may recall that the, we did not do any invited papers in special issues, and we really did have a mentoring commitment to our authors to make sure that we helped them develop the best work that they could. Uh, but with help from our reviewers and from me as the editor. So um, I'm going to wrap up fairly quickly in the interest of time, but I wanted to say a word about the personal impact that editing gender and society had on me. And for that, I'm, I looked at my last from the editor column saying that 
editing the journal had sharpened my own writing. Now, why in the world would that be the case? Because in those days, we did our own copy editing. And what I remember is reading grammar books frequently to make sure that I sharpened my own editorial skills. Since that day, you're gonna crack up. I actually love line editing. <laughs> so keep it in mind, people. Um, I find it rather relaxing, and maybe that was because I was learning how to do it while being a senior administrator, and it was a moment to get away from the madness of the university. I also said in my final column that therefore editing gender and society made me a better writer. It made me a better mentor because of gender and society's commitment to feminist scholarship and to feminist scholars. It gave me also much more appreciation of the diverse forms of feminist scholarship that gender and society published and continues to publish. And it also introduced, excuse me, introduced me to a wider circle of new colleagues. Um, so I have to give a shout out to my two managing editors, Catherine Simile and Kim Loggio, and also to the two book review editors who served with me, first Gay Tuckman and then Elizabeth Higginbotham. And then finally, I found in my last From the Editor uh, column, a wonderful essay that I forgot that I had written, that intent is to demystify the publishing process. And I reread it, it's actually quite good, and I'm gonna talk with some of you, then think about republishing it maybe in network news because nobody's gonna go back to the 1995 from the editor issue, gotcha, uh, and read that piece, but there's very good advice in it. So I'll follow up this meeting today with possibly putting that in the hands of younger scholars. So with that, thank you all very much. I wish we could all clap or something. <laughs> Thank you, Maggie. That was great. Um, and I'm, as a little uh, side look here, I'm going to be also be talking about that, the amount of paperwork, because I was the editor where the transition occurred between all the paper mm -hmm. and not so much paper. But I'll come back to that on my own turn, not somebody else's. Um, this third editor was Beth E. Schneider. Professor Emerita in the Departments of Sociology and Feminist Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Beth has been chair of the ASA Sexuality Section and president of the Pacific Sociological Association and received the SWS Mentoring Award. She is author of several books, including Women Resisting AIDS, Feminist Strategies of Empowerment, and Social Perspectives on Lesbian and Gay Studies, and is co author with Peter Nardi of the Lesbian and Gay Studies Reader, as well as editor of two special issues of Gender and Society, the first on sexual identity, sexual communities, and another on heteronormativity and sexualities. I'm turning it over to you, Beth. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Hi, thank you, Chris. Um, what can I say? I started out um, in a wonderful position because Judith came before me and so did Maggie. Um, I was an editor for four years, um, and that's 24 issues, just in case anybody is keeping, keeping track. Um, and over that time, I had three managing editors, um, two of whom are probably familiar to one or more of you, Judith Taylor at the University of Toronto and Jane Ward at the University of California at Riverside. Um, ours was the last office in which everything was done in paper. Um, Maggie delivered the boxes to us, and I delivered the boxes to Chris. Um, and we understood by the time the third issue was coming around that we were, we were a pathway for junior scholars to be seen and heard, as well as represent some of the best, the best work of, um, of the more senior people. The experience for me was challenging, educational, and humbling, always. Um, and I, too, read all my editor's notes um, and the note we wrote for the journal in order to think about this. And I guess I would say, because um, I'm going to try to not talk about the technical part, but some of the intellectual things that I think were going on through my time. Um, I guess to kick it off, we would say you can't always get what you want, but you get what you need. And as an editor of a journal, 
that's open to um, every scholar in many fields. Most issues are some intriguing uh, eclectic mix of articles on gender, some of them not worth publishing at all, um, some of them needing so much work. Multiple gender in multiple places, multiple times, multiple settings, multiple institutions, not thematic at all. And so if you look at our issues, all of our issues over all the years, most of them are not thematic issues and certainly they're not special issues at all. Often, if we were lucky in our backlogs, which some of us had in some years and some of us didn't, uh, in our backlogs, we would find really wonderful work that could be made thematic. And I'm reminded of one particular instance. There was always, and there still is, there was always so much scholarship about work, economic inequality, and sexual harassment during my period of time. There was always enough to publish thematic sections. And one in particular I'm reminded of was um, by Mary Zimmerman, who provided a lead introduction to an issue that turned out to be almost all either about work or about migration. Um, and here I only say that Zimmerman's, Zimmerman's work at that time, um, she was attempting to really look at all the ways in which women's, women's labor was devalued both at home and in, in the household. And I just took a look at it briefly. And it's really, it seems like it's really old school. On the one hand, we all know this, this was 20 years ago um, that this all happened. And on the other hand, it's actually worth a, a, a serious review because it illuminates much of the discussion we're currently having about women's labor during this pandemic, both at home and um, in the workplace. The other was focused on migration. And I would say these three articles um, written by women who were writing about Mexico, South Asia, and Puerto Rico. Um, these three articles did a splendid job early on of, of pointing us to critique, the critique and the usefulness of a transnational scholarship perspective. So just to say that, you know, when you begin as an editor, and all of us have them, we have these statements about what we really wanted to do um, and what we hope to accomplish. And following from Maggie, I would say that there were three kinds of things that were in the air um, in my life and in the scholarship um, that seemed like thematics that came up over and over again. And for me, I tried to fashion them into something. So the three substantive areas broadly construed in these issues were about something I'm calling how gender was manifested in and through social movements, um, the relationship of gender and sexuality, and gendered policies and practices in institutions and organizations. And additionally, and as a goal, not so much as a theme, but as a goal for scholarship overall, was something Maggie already made more than an allusion to, which was to demonstrate intersectionality, to demonstrate sociologically the intersection of multiple systems of oppression. And in, the, in my beginning and opening, I'm gonna read you this, um, here's my, here was my goal, and it's worth considering because I think all of us are going to still say this is the goal. Um, um, I was particularly interested in, I was hungry for a systematic data collection on the undocumented activities of grassroots and community organizations and more sustained theorizing about the interrelations of sexuality, gender, race, and class. I was particularly interested in exploring uh, how social change movements obscure, ignore, or mismanage the complexity of these issues. Second, I was driven, and by this time, this was an appropriate thing, I guess, to be driven by. I was driven by a recognition of the emerging conflict between the problematics and debates of feminist scholarship in sociology and those of queer theorizing as it was developing in the 1990s um, in the humanities. So in my first issue, here's what I wanted. I mean, in the first issue, here's what I said I wanted. Um, to understand the relationship of systems of domination, to understand the dynamics of the intersections of all four of what we were calling those, um, those systems, and the production and transformation of the social institutions of heterosexuality. Okay, so this is all well and good as um, a statement. And I would, I would say that the editor's notes did allow me to think as I was reading them, I went, oh my gosh, 
here I am six months later saying, I wish I can get the authors to please think about intersectionality, even if they're not writing about race, to please think about their, their the subjects in terms of those systems of domination, even when they think they're only, descri only describing white women. Um, there was a kind of way that this went on and on for me. I kept writing about it in different editor's notes. And later, Sorry about that. How long have I been muted? Not very long, Beth. Oh, okay. A, a All right, so, so. Okay, I started to worry that even in the work in which, um, in which somebody was trying effectively to think about intersectionality, that it was easier for scholars to be thinking about class than thinking about race. And at least in, in the period of time in which I was the editor, that seemed to be, that stuck out for me. So I'd be curious to see what, what subsequent editors think. Then having, um, having my home at the University of California at Santa Barbara, I had the experience of living with the Doing Gender article forever and ever and ever. And, um, and also had the experience of thinking, wait, well, wait, doing gender, is not at the individual level and it's not necessarily only at the interpersonal level it's really at a more um, a more structural level i really wanted to be thinking how is gender done and here how is gender done was very important to me in terms of the production of policy and practice in organizational settings not simply comparisons of women and men but how the political context institutional arrangements themselves shape who's in and who's out, what rules are enacted, what outcomes are typical, and who they favor. So therefore, I wanted to, to look for and occasionally found, I wanted to think of the state or a corporation or an organization or a committee or a policy or a movement as gendered and racialized, and to move the sociological study very far from a discussion in any kind of psychological frame. There were examples that came up over the four years of my editorship in any discussion in which feminists were able to say out loud, and I still think we, it needs to be done, um, that um, anything where things are ungendered, where talk is ungendered, I got, um, where talk is ungendered, where we're talking about senior citizens or welfare recipients without any attention to the, who those people actually are. And just to, on a bid, Dana Britton did a really beautiful book um, on the internal practices of organizations and the ways in which they themselves suggest masculinized organizations. For me, the social movements business got picked up in the special issue edited by Verda Taylor and Nancy Whittier, um, which there were two issues, one that came out under my term, one that came out under Chris's, that really took to task the social movements literature generally for the ways in which it didn't think about gender in terms of opportunity structures, tactics, strategy, or anything else. And finally, for me, um, that are the issue on, sexu on sexuality before I was the editor and the issue on, in quotes, heteronormativity way after I was the editor were both in my, for me, efforts to continue to think about sexuality in relationship to gender, to revisit over and over again the thinking sex piece by Gail Rubin that, that laid, laid bare for everyone to think about what is the relationship of gender to sexuality um, over time, what constitutes the sexual normal or not. Um, and putting heteronormativity at the forefront in the more recent issue was a kind of way of thinking about um, intersectionality in a slightly different framing. Um, so at the end of it, my goal, my, my goal as an editor ended precipitously at the end of the 20th century. Um, and it seemed to me there was considerable work that needed to be done to expand um, transnational frameworks, to think about what we were and were not getting when we look at intersectional work. 
um, what we continue to include or not include about sexuality. When do we let it just go to the sexualities journal, which emerged at that period of time? When do we take it as gender and society work? Um, and how do we continue to think about it? So I'm grateful for um, all of us who've been editors and um, always delighted to, to know that all the editors that followed after me, with the possible exception of Barbara, um, were got published under my time as editor uh, the first time or on my editorial board. So there's just a kind of interesting genealogy there. So I'm gonna toss it to Chris as I did at the time um, when she became the editor after me. So Chris, you can introduce yourself and um, thank you actually for recognizing that I actually thankfully retired um, this year and um, thanks. You're welcome, Beth. <laughs> I'm glad it means my research on what we were all doing worked out okay. <laughs> I spent probably spent half the time finding out what we were doing and half the time finding out what I had done in the same way everybody else did. I read all my old uh, from the editor things to right. see what I had published and what I was thinking. So obviously there's some similar research strategies. Okay, so I'm gonna start introducing myself in the third person and then switch to the first. Uh, Christine Bowles is Professor Emerita from the Department of Sociology, as well as Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies and Latin American, Caribbean, US Latino Studies at the University at Albany, SUNY. I was the fourth editor from 2000 to 2003 Currently, I'm an affiliate faculty member at the University of Washington in Seattle in both uh, what they call here GWIS, Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies, and Sociology. I have been president of SWS, organizing the winter meetings in Puerto Rico, probably the fact for which I'm most remembered as president. Mm -hmm. uh, SWS feminist lecturer and president of the Eastern Sociological Society. I think that my links to uh, gender and society give me a kind of multifaceted view of the journal because I was a member of the founding committee and represented the sex and gender section on that founding committee. Uh, I helped initiate contract renegotiations in 2000 with SAGE and later was a member of the 0506 committee that took multiple publishers bids to negotiate a new contract and consider if we wanted to shift publishers. I've also served on two editor search committees and chaired both the ASA and SWS publications committees. My research areas are US and global gender inequalities, labor market issues, migration, and race, ethnicity, class differences slash interactions. I co-founded Albany's Institute for Research on Women and um, my First book was entitled Jobs and Gender, a Study of Occupational Prestige, but my most recent publications have been on global gender issues, including the co-edited volume, Global Gender Research, Transnational Perspectives, which I did with Min Jong Kim, who was my managing editor uh, during my full term. Uh, also, most recently, Gender and Society articles on patterns of global gender inequalities and regional gender regimes, and intersectionality and global gender inequality. You can already see from the descriptions how each editor built upon the other with new senses of what needed to be done. Pardon me while I switch pages. Okay, so my major goal uh, as editor was to increase the coverage of international gender issues in articles by non-US authors and as Beth said, to increase the transnationality of the journal. This effort had multiple prongs. The in the first, uh, our managing editors just tracked the manuscripts and found that we had had a high rate of international submissions, actually between 23 and 27% per year. Of course, I'm sure a lot of them were from Canada and other speaking countries, but nonetheless, a quarter of the manuscripts submitted. That Simple information encouraged SAGE to revitalize an international subscription campaign for GNS, which gave us more international exposure. Uh, in increasing international readership was important, but it didn't necessarily increase the publication on international gender issues. Two aspects of the review process I felt impeded that goal. First, our reviewers didn't always recognize when all the relevant literature from a given country had been cited, 
and often asked for some relevant literature from the US, uh, which might not have been a fair expectation. Second, in the US, we expect research articles to give detailed descriptions of methodology, sampling procedures, data, but in some countries, these co topics are considered fairly mundane and they receive a lot less coverage in their articles while giving priority to theoretical elaboration. Those two differences often resulted in international articles not being accepted or revisory submitted sometimes either. Because uh, when such literature methods were missing, a sim submitted paper tend to get a lower rating. So address, to address that, I began an article series of what I called International Perspectives on Gender, or excuse me, gender research, to review key gender studies and issues in a variety of countries or regions. And I did publish articles on Spain, Cuba, India, Puerto Rico, China, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And actually, one of the co-authors of um, the article on Sub-Saharan Africa was Josephine Beaku Betts, our current SWS president, and then the book re review editor, or rather co-editor with Linda Grant during my term. So there are just patterns and waves of interconnections among us. Uh, the goal was to familiarize readers with a wide range of topics, research methods, and writing styles of leading feminist social science authors around the world. This, uh, this need was probably further pushed along by having been an editor during September 11th, 2001 attacks on the World Trade Center, and it was clear to me that sociological theory couldn't always be applied effectively outside of the US, and that we shouldn't be just studying global others, but needed to look at the reciprocal effects between the US and other developing countries, and not just in one direction. My editor's introduction in April of 2002 again noted the vital need to publish more mm -hmm, social science research on international gender issues as defined within those countries, because what were gender inequalities here were not perceived to be necessarily the same priorities in other countries. And in fact, in that issue, Natalie Bennett also had observed that there was a missing international revolution in feminist sociology. The third thing I did was encourage special issues such as the Global Perspectives on Gender and Care Work issue, uh, guest co-edited by Jacqueline Litt and Mary Zimmerman. This issue appeared 12 years after the uh, only previous special issue on international issues published by Judith Lorber. And that was uh, on women and development in the third world, edited by myself and Edna Costa Belen. In a similar vein, special issues have been sometimes important in focusing on women of color. For example, again, during my term, there was a special issue guest edited by Marley Sturr and Shirley Hill entitled African and American Women, Gender Relations, Work, and the Political Economy in the 21st Century. This issue was published basically on the 10-year anniversary of the 1992 gender and society issue that Maggie Anderson published on race, class, and, or excuse me, race, class, and gender, um, which she herself has mentioned. The difference being that by the time I was editor, there could be a whole special issue on one group of women of color, not all of them together. Uh, I also began an exchange with other journals for at least for the office, the Asian Journal of Women's Studies and the European Journal of Women's Studies came to us and we sent our journal to them. We also added new international advisory editors and I even co-organized a panel of Latin American, Caribbean and US based scholarly journal editors on promoting collaborations among feminist journals, which was a part of a, conference on gender and globalization in the Americas held at the University of Costa Rica in 2003. On an artistic note, I also introduced the first three color cover uh, for our journal and consciously chose art from different regions of the world for each of the years of my editorship. Indeed, I found that uh, sort of reflecting back on what um, I believe it was Maggie said, I found that my international focus for gender society spurred my own research interest and resulted in my um, 2012 Gender and Society Symposium on Patricia Hill's Collins. My contribution to that symposium was called Intersectionality and Global Gender Inequality. 
as well as focusing my feminist lecture, SWS feminist lecture on patterns of global gender inequalities and regional gender regimes. Whoops, sorry, excuse me. I realized I didn't restart my timer for myself. Um, other quick observations, I think, as, as uh, several people have said, publishing the SWS feminist lectures was important. I also found that uh, I ended up doing a symposium and occasional symposiums on controversial pieces were good. The one I published was on uh, Baxter and Eric Olin Wright's The Glass Ceiling Hypothesis. I found that at least in, in my time, you couldn't practically have a theory section in an article that didn't mention doing gender, first published by Judith, but even through my editorial term, it was sine qua non, you pretty much had to cite that article. And, uh, and that always was clear to me. The other thing that I did, I think might have been new, I'm not sure. It's a different version of Maggie's mentoring, is I taught a graduate course called Reviewing and Journal Publishing, Gender and Society on my campus with the goal of uh, giving people practical advice on how to review, or graduate students, practical advice on how to review articles for journals and prepare manuscripts for submission so that they could get insiders' perspectives on how the review process worked, broadening their understanding of social science through exposure to different substantive areas. And a lot of these students were not necessarily in gender studies, but the breadth of our own articles allowed them to engage uh, with this is uh, quote unquote coursework and understanding the structure of articles, helping to focus their own writing. And like Maggie, I find I still enjoy editing too. Um, although we were probably among the very last line editors. The last thing I want to refer to uh, is the really changing journal structure on, on at least three levels in the midst of my term as editor. There was a rapid increase in the number of submissions, slow shifts to electronically based operations, and steady increases in editorial office funding. I was the last of the editors who started as kind of mostly broke. Um, during my term, the number of manuscript submissions began what was a long-term upward trajectory, increasing 39% over the course of uh, my term. <laughs> which made me to suggest to the editorial board that, and the publications committee that uh, the edit, next edit, editor, excuse me, should include an, an editorial, not an editor, a deputy editor structure that at that time, no one knew what form that might take, but it was clearly gonna be important for the number of articles we were dealing with. The second challenge is, as we've all said to, up to me, was the technological transformations. When I started, I got that box of past manuscripts. We sent out manuscripts uh, in the mail. We asked reviewers by mail, et cetera. By the end of my term, we had created our own searchable electronic review database, and we solicited manuscript reviews via email. And we received at least the final reviews via internet as well. We actually had wanted to receive manuscript submissions electronically, uh, and send them to reviewers the same way. But at the time, and this is gonna sound a little funny, the SWS Publications Committee didn't let us do that. They were concerned perhaps appropriately about potential violations of confidentiality and plagiarism of manuscripts. We were not able to complete that stage of electronic transition, but the problem was resolved after my editorial term when Sage Publications switched to its web-based electronic manuscript submission. Also during my term, as I've indicated, um, the, the journal office didn't have very much money and we on our campus helped contribute to supporting it, at least via graduate students, et cetera. But with the new contract that occurred during my term, all of a sudden there was much more decent support for the journal and the journal's page allocation was increased to 960 pages per year. Sage also created a new advertising campaign around the journal. So that was really excellent. So those were the kind of changes that I experienced and my focus pretty consistently across all my editorial ed editor, um, from the editor writings 
were about increasing internationality, transnationality, and really learning to see gender from the perspective or from, let's say, from a non-US perspective with all the interactions with class, race, and coloniality that that might mean. Um, so thank you everybody for listening and I apologize if I ran over, I can't show myself a yellow card and I forgot to turn on the timer for myself. But uh, I'm going to move on and, and turn it over to the next editor after myself. Uh, in this case, there was a continuity of names following myself was Christine Williams. And Christine is at the University of Texas, Austin and was editor from 2004 to 06. She is the Elsie and Stanley Abrams, excuse me, Adams Senior Centennial Professor of Liberal Arts at the University of Texas. And as you, you all know, she's the 2020 president of the ASA. In fact, I believe her presidential address is later this afternoon. She has won the Jesse Bernard Award. She has been the SWS Feminist Lecturer and received the SWS Feminist Mentoring Award. She is author of several books, among them, um, Still a Man's World, Men Who Do Women's Work, in which she introduced the concept of the glass elevator and later revised and updated that with the changing times in her SWS Feminist Lecture. In 2006, she published the volume Inside Toyland, Working, Shopping, and Social Inequality. And she's currently working and writing a book on uh, the oil and gas industry. My pleasure to turn it over to Christine Williams. Thank you, Chris, and, and thank you, um, Josephine and the committee and Barrett for organizing us. It's just um, wonderful to be part of this group and part of the celebration. And um, I really I really see myself as the beneficiary of everyone that that came before me. Um, I um, it's just been wonderful to hear your reflections about how you made the journal what it is because I feel like I inherited a, a feminist legacy. And as editor, I kind of felt that my role was was to continue that legacy. Um, I I don't I don't see what I did differently um, from what you all have described. Um, so hopefully I was, I was uh, in the three years that I was editor, a steward of the values and the commitments that you brought uh, to uh, SWS, from SWS and, and, and to the journal. So it's, with, it's just with tremendous respect and gratitude that um, I see myself as the beneficiary of your work and hopefully continuing on in that same vein over the course of my three years. So I was editor for three years from 2004 to 2006. I did have deputy editors, including Dana Britton and Jyoti Puri. Um, the book review editors were Josephine and uh, Linda Grant um, for most of my term. The last year they were replaced by uh, Barbara Ryan when their term terms were over. Um, I had terrific support from graduate students who are now distinguished professors of sociology. Uh, Gretchen Weber and uh, Katie Connell uh, were two of my uh, graduate student assistants at the journal. So the journal began when the year that I got my PhD. Um, it's so important that as a sociologist that there was finally an outlet for research um, from a sociological perspective. And, and Judith, I was just so, I, I'm so grateful because uh, what you started really made possible uh, feminist sociology. The, the other journals that existed at the time were all interdisciplinary. Um, there was, of course, Science and Feminist Studies, Women's Studies International Forum, um, or else they had a psychological perspective like sex roles did. Um, and, and it's interesting because I know a lot of young feminists, feminists today really embrace interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity, um, but I'm actually a big fan of disciplinarity um, in part because I experienced what the world was like without a home, without a home in sociology for the, for the study of gender. And for that, you know, I will always be grateful to you, uh, Judith, for making that happen. Um, now, it is true that before Gender and Society came around, uh, I read much more widely than I do today. 
Um, feminists in sociology, when I got started, uh, knew what feminists in philosophy and history and literary studies were doing. Um, however, those journals did not necessarily grapple with sociological methods or concepts. So we found ourselves, if we were trying to publish, you know, often being reviewed by historians and psychologists who, who didn't really understand this social structural perspective that we were bringing to the game. And again, you know, that's why gender and society is just such a significant moment in the history of feminist sociology. Um, the downside uh, prior to gender and society was that if we did get into those feminist journals, we were marginalized by the discipline as a whole because what we were doing was not seen as sociology. Um, and again, I think gender and society really changed that. It brought the study of gender into the mainstream. So like I said, when I took over as editor, it I did so with, with just enormous gratitude uh, for this, this legacy. And I understood my role as cultivating and promoting the, the scholarship of other uh, sociologists, just as every one of these former editors did for me. Um, I, I was mentored as an author by all of, all of my predecessors, and I just, I saw my role as, as giving back. Um, in fact, that's why I wanted to become editor, to give back for the amazing mentoring that I had received at the hands of my predecessors, and I hope that I was able to achieve that um, as editor. Um, one of the things I've always really loved about SWS um, and, and, and the, the journal in, in particular is its focus on scholarly mentoring. Um, this, this, is a, this is a community effort. One of the things I really noticed right away as editor was people really had ownership of this, of this journal. Members of SWS cared about it. Uh, when, I, when I would ask people to review for the journal, Virtually no one said no, and 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 they gave they gave deep and engaged uh, reviews of the work, and they and they and they tried very hard to make things very positive. It was a very supportive community that I think uh, that you all, my predecessors, built, and I and I hope is still the spirit of this journal, uh, because it very much was uh, at the time understood to be a community um, effort. Um, reviewers were very generous with their time and they took their role very seriously. Now, that doesn't mean that I always agreed with reviewers. Um, my predecessors don't talk about this, but I often actually disagreed with them. Um, if, however, if they liked a paper and I didn't, I never overruled the reviewers. I, I would never do that. I mean, the paper got in. Uh, but on a number of occasions, I liked the paper and the reviewers didn't. And I would sometimes uh, publish it anyway. Um, and, and because I, they were saying something that was new or fresh, or they were saying something freshly and that was old, but they were doing it in a new way. Um, I, I had my biases. And, and when I look back through uh, the journals that I edited, I can, I can kind of see that. I can kind of see um, an emphasis on kind of sparkly, different, um, off the beaten track kind of uh, articles that, that um, I hope uh, is my legacy, my personal legacy. Um, uh, I cared less about literature reviews and I, I still don't care very much about literature reviews. Sometimes I feel oppressed by all the citations in our journals today. I don't know if you all feel that way. Um, I wish authors were allowed to speak in their own voices more instead of relying so heavily on what happened uh, you know, in the past. Um, it's becoming harder and harder to read journals when single sentences um, you know, include multiple lists of citations. But I'm probably an outlier here. Um, readability really matters a lot to me. And again, I was a beneficiary of those line editing, all that line editing that happened before me. So, so making articles readable is just really, really important and was important to me as editor. Um, I was probably too heavy handed in my editing, looking back, uh, but I really wanted articles that were punchy and most of all, I wanted articles that would be read. Um, unlike my predecessors, I did not make a lot of changes to the journal when I was editor. 
Um, I did insist on paying a stipend to the deputy editors. I mean, Chris mentioned that we finally had a little bit of money, a budget. And so that was one of the things that I insisted on. Um, I enlarged the font, you know, that's, <laughs> that's one of my accomplishments. It used to be so tiny. I mean, I can't even imagine. Um, not, if, if I had it to do over, there are things that I think I, I would have done differently. So let me just list those. I mean, because I don't, I don't see the kind of real, you know, substantive changes in my editorship as I, as I see so clearly in, in that of my predecessors. So one of the changes I would have um, wanted if I could do it over, um, I would have gotten rid of that division between articles and research reports and perspectives. Um, let, the, let the reader take what they will from what's offered. I mean, this whole process of categorizing was just kind of odd. And, uh, it, and it, it made, um, it made uh, uh, some authors feel, feel like they were doing you know, not as good if it wasn't a regular article versus a research report. So I, I would probably have pushed to get rid of that distinction. Um, at the time, I really wanted to publish more illustrations and pictures. Um, but authors didn't do that. And I, I, I think it would be so awesome if Gender and Society would do more of that. I know we have our blog, but it would be so cool to, to include like images and, and even video clips and the articles that we were producing now. So I'm just throwing that out. Um, I would also push to do away with second R&Rs. I hate second R&Rs. Um, as an author and as an editor, I didn't like them either. Um, I think one round of reviews um, should be enough and editors should then accept or reject. I think it's torture for authors to go through more than one round of reviews. So that's, that's my personal perspective, but it's, it, I have that memory of that, um, you know, what, what that felt like um, as an editor, having to, to put authors through these multiple rounds, um, even when their work, I mean, clearly needed to be published. Um, also getting, I, I'm just so interested to hear about your experiences with special issues. During my term, getting a special issue approved was like torture. It was, it was a very difficult process. I only got to publish one special issue. It was on uh, transnational feminist sociology um, edited by um, Gioti Puri, Hyun Suk Kim, and Paolo Bocetta. And I think it might have even had its origination under you, Chris. I, I mean, I'm not sure, but I mean, it was a fabulous issue and, and you know, assigned a lot in classes. So, so I wish I could have done more of that um, uh, in order to encourage sort of burgeoning or uh, uh, developing lines of inquiry uh, within sociology. Uh, but, but it was a very difficult process. So, so let, me just, let me just conclude by saying Gender and Society is an amazing success. It gave gender scholarship a home in sociology. And the biggest challenge I think right now is that we don't turn that home into a prison. Uh, there's got to remain room for creativity, style, avant-garde thinking, expression, all of these things. And I think SWS is absolutely committed to that vision. And I see gender and society continuing to morph in, in new directions under you know, the able guidance of, of our editors, our feminist editors uh, going, going forward into the future. So, so again, thank you very much. And thank you for, for letting me be part of this process. Thank you, Chris. Uh, okay, you can hear me, I can see that. <laughs> uh, you said a lot of different things there, but one of the uh, earlier things you mentioned that resonated with me was that the journal is really collective. I think that is true on so many levels. Working with managing editors, deputy editors is a collective process. Working with all our reviewers is a collective process. One of the things I most enjoyed about being editor was going to the ASA because I felt I knew everyone. Mm -hmm. I would read, read a name tag and know they had been a reviewer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was like they were my friend, even though they might not know who I was. So I can resonate with that part of what you said. But in the interest of moving along, I'm going to move on to our sixth editor, Dana Britton, who is on the faculty at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, where she's professor and now chair of 
Labor Studies and Employment Relations, and also Director of the Center for Women and Work. Dana's research uh, focuses on the ways organization, organization structure and reproduce gender inequalities at work across the dimensions of gender, race, class, and sexuality. Her current project funded by an NSF advance grant focuses on gender and the transition between associate and full professor, particularly for faculty in the STEM fields. Her previous research has examined gender and work in sex segregated organizations reflected in her book on prisons at work in the iron cage and gender and formal social control the gender of crime, the latter of which is in its second edition. She's been an NSF program officer and been a site visitor at many campuses and has chaired the SWS Publications Committee. It's my pleasure to welcome now from Colorado RV Camp, uh, Dana Britton. Thank you, Chris. And I don't actually both chair my department and direct a center. I only chair my department, which is plenty at, at this point. Um, so, um, all right. So I, I will start out by saying that I also felt like I inherited an incredible legacy when I took over uh, as editor of Gender and Society and, and, and sort of built on the work of so many people who came before me and, were, and certainly I was mentored by those who came before me. I published, as I remember, under Maggie Beth and Chris Bowes, and of course I was the first PhD student of Christine Williams, so um, certainly I benefited from the legacy of all of those of you who came before me. Um, my comments will probably focus much more on a sort of production of knowledge uh, standpoint because I think, you know, in some ways for me, and, and Christine mentioned, Christine Williams, Chris Williams mentioned that she, the journal um, first appeared when she finished her PhD, the journal, uh, I entered my graduate program uh, just in the first year that the journal was published in 1987. So for me, it had always been a fact of my professional existence. It was not sort of a, a feminist reform project in the same way. It was sort of an up and going concern by the time that I became editor. Um, I wanna thank also my deputy editors, uh, Bandana Parkiasta, Sharon Bird, Betsy Leukel. Um, I wanna thank the my office staff, I think we, we spend far too little time talking about the important, the incredibly important role that they perform in making sure the journal gets out the door. Uh, in my case, they called themselves the Minions and uh, the, they were Laura, Lo the main group of them was Laura Logan, uh, Sarah Jones and Sarah Donnelly, so I thank them. I also want to thank the editorial board whose efforts we, all, we also don't spend enough time talking about. They are the people who will sort of pick up and give you a third review or who will suggest other reviewers and they were absolutely essential to making sure things get out the door. Um, they also fill critical gaps in an editor's knowledge and an editorial team's knowledge. My editorial board knew very well my, dis my discomfort with papers that had to do with blood and bodies. Um, and so uh, they were always there to take on those uncomfortable topics for me. Um, it was, I, when I took over as editor of Gender and Society, I was the first person to do it from a sort of a small university. Um, Kansas State University is sort of not an AAU institution, as you probably know. Um, and so that was sort of new and different. Um, we also were, thanks to Chris Bose's efforts, one of the first offices to have a substantial budget. So we were able to pay graduate students, we paid deputy editors, uh, we helped sustain other office staff, so that made a huge difference. Um, my office did bring the journal up online, to uh, totally in the uh, Manuscript Central system. I do, by the way, still have some card file boxes sitting in my basement, which I think belong to Chris Bowes. Um, someday I will give them to whatever archive wants to take the Gender and Society card file, but they've now moved with me across two states and at least three houses. Um, so I do still have them. Um, we brought, as I say, we brought the journal up on, online totally. Uh, that was a learning process both for us and for SAGE. Uh, the early process did not, uh, SAGE had for some reason not ever dealt with double blind review. So we found ourselves sort of trying to teach them the, the technology of how to do that. Um, we also fought a long battle not to be abbreviated as GAS in the um, SAGE Manuscript Central System, which we are actually still GAS. We're sorry about that, we really tried. Um, one of the effects of going online was that our submissions increased a lot. 
Um, and what happened was uh, what I used to call sort of the pasta model of uh, article submission, which is, you know, we're just going to sort of throw this on the wall and see if it sticks. Uh, we got a lot of odd, really bizarre papers. Um, I got, I mean, I used to have it, we used to keep a top 10 list, but I can certainly remember a paper we got on a menstruation and bears. Um, and these are not the hairy gay man kind of bears. These are the actual, like, you know, uh, kind of bears that they have here in the mountains. Um, we got a paper on uh, women's bones from a particular site in Africa. We got a three page paper on gender, the alphabet. Um, we got quite, quite a, yeah, we got quite a variety of uh, papers that were not relevant to gendered society's mission. I, I would often send out a note that said, have you read the mission statement at all? Um, so this actually, though it's entertaining in some ways, um, created a problem for the mentorship model that, um, that Maggie discussed, right? So there was this sort of sense early on that everything that came to gender and society should get a review. Um, and I made the decision that, uh, and this was a decision that I think was long in coming, um, that we had to move away from that model. That in fact, we had to start doing a fair number of what Sage called desk rejects. Um, and the idea was, I think, to sort of maximize the, the intellectual power and the efforts of my editorial board and my reviewers. Um, but it wasn't popular. Um, uh, Sage liked it for a variety of reasons. Uh, there were political struggles within SWS about it, and I'm sure the struggles continue. Uh, I will say that I did, uh, for everyone who got a desk reject from us, as long as it was not a three-page paper on gender and the alphabet, they usually got a page or a page and a half for me about the paper and how the paper might be uh, made better. I did, uh, and I'm not sure if I'm the last editor who did, but I, I did also line edit. Um, many people spent many hours dealing with me and line edits. Um, so, so certainly there was a shift at that time. There was a shift when we moved online also away from what um, Sage called an issue economy to what they, call, what they called an article economy. So I stopped doing the from, I was, I think maybe Christine Williams stopped them too. I didn't do the from the editors. Partly because Sage's argument was nobody picks up the journal and reads it cover to cover anymore, which is probably true and probably sad, right? Because I can remember all those times that I, you know, sort of was randomly browsing the stacks in the library and picked, a, picked up a journal and saw an article that was really interesting to me that I wouldn't have found. But, um, but we were certainly moving, I think, away from that model at that time. Um, so, so technology changed a lot during my editorship. Uh, another thing that I focused on, and I think I was the first editor to do this in a systematic way, was the impact factor of the journal, uh, which was a decision which was also, I think, controversial. Um, the politics of that were that I really wanted, impact factors are imperfect for a thousand reasons that I could, we could talk about for hours, and be, but it would be a really boring conversation. Um, but what I, the politics of that for me was that I could imagine the lone feminist scholar at a department uh, in which, you know, all of her colleagues were publishing in, say, social forces. And the argument was, you know, well, but gender and society's impact factor is, you know, 0.4 and social forces is 1.5 or whatever it might be. So I made a study of how to ethically increase the impact factor. Um, and there are lots of ways you can do that. One of them is as simple as article timing, right? You publish an article in February, it has a lot more time to be cited. Um, so if you look at my February issues, you'll see that I tried to front load articles I thought were going to be highly cited. Um, another way that we did it was by publishing article, publishing symposia, and I thank Chris Bowes for this piece of advice. We published three symposia during my uh, period as editor. Two of them focused on um, uh, feminist lectures. Uh, First was, by, first was Maggie Anderson's feminist lecture on intersectionality. The second was Paula England's on uh, the pace of feminist change stalled revolutions. Uh, the third, I was very, very lucky to be editor during the 25th anniversary year of Weston Zimmerman's Doing Gender. And so we were able to publish a symposium on uh, Doing Gender that included Weston Zimmerman's first sort of reflection uh, on that piece in, in many, many years. Another thing I'm very proud of about the symposia is that we very consciously tried to pair junior and senior scholars. 
Um, so I actually was like, you don't actually do a lot of line editing of Dorothy Smith. You'll, you'll probably won't be surprised to know, but I published, was able to publish Dorothy Smith, uh, uh, Raywin Connell, Barbara Bergman, uh, Barbara Rissman, Joan Acker, but at the same time in those symposia, we published Nikki Jones, Salvador Vidal Ortiz, uh, Adia Harvey Wingfield, Kristen Schilt. So we, we made a very conscious process, or uh, it was a very conscious practice for us of actually pairing junior and senior scholars in that way. Senior scholars generally do not just sort of send articles in over the transom. You're not just going to sit at your desk one day and Ray Wynn Connell will send you a piece, right? Um, but one of the ways you can do that is by doing symposia. And those symposia both are a contribution intellectually, which is the important part, but they also are cited. Um, those those pieces tend to be highly cited, and they also tend to help uh, boost the impact factors. So, um, so they were. It was sort of a, a dual purpose uh, for us. Um, so, I think, yeah, those are the things I'm 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 proud of. Um, and uh, let's see, if I have anything else. Um, and and you know, there's cer certainly there's a politics to this in terms of changes in the organization. When I, when I came in, the very first big budgets made a difference. Um, there was a lot of debate in SWS about how that money should be spent, whether that money should go to the editorial office, how it should come to the office, and I'm happy we, again, could have a boring discussion about that. But it, there was a lot of strain, and those of us who are sociologists of feminist organizations can probably understand that, right? Gender and society went from being a shoestring operation to an operation with a pretty substantial budget. Uh, and that created strains in the politics of running the journal and in the politics of SWS. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. That was really great, Dana. I appreciate your being willing to talk about the, let me see, I don't want to say the challenges, the debates that occurred during your term as, as well as what you accomplished as editor. And I was really interested to hear how you about your strategies on how you worked on increasing the impact factor. I was really all previously more aware of your focus on doing so than how you did it. And that was like super helpful to hear about your strategy. So thank you. Sure, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So now on to our seventh editor, uh, Joya Misra of the University of Massachusetts Amherst, who is professor of sociology and public policy and I hope still director of the Institute for Social Science Research. Joya is also the 2020 vice president of the ASA. Her research in the areas of inequality, race, gender, class, work and labor, political sociology and welfare states has been supported by several NSF grants among other uh, funding. Her most recent co-author books are the new handbook of political sociology and gendered live sexual beings. As gender and society editor, like myself, she had a focus on internationalizing or transnationalizing gender and society, but I will let her tell you about that and welcome Joya Misra to our panel. <laughs> Thank you so much and thanks, to, thanks for being included in this. I'm really excited, this is wonderful. Margaret said, lucky me, but I'm even more lucky because I got to follow all of these amazing editors, Judith, Margaret, Beth, Chris, Christine, and Dana, who couldn't have been more generous and supportive. I remain endlessly surprised that I had the good fortune to edit Gender and Society for four years. It's probably the thing I've done in my career that I enjoyed the most outside of mentoring students and I always saw it as part of my mentoring practice. Um, editing Gender and Society happened. I think this is important to know only because somebody asked me if I wanted to apply. Um, I had had the good luck of publishing pieces under both Beth Schneider and Dana Britton. I knew that my work got better through the journal. I had the great luck to serve on Chris Bose's editorial board and see her really visionary approach. I knew that I loved reading gender research. I loved giving feedback on writing. And most of all, I knew that since graduate school, I started a year after Dana in 1988, the journal I had read most consistently cover to cover was Gender and Society. So getting to be a chance um, of, to be a part of it was a dream come true. Um, I've looked at my letter of application. I didn't really do those opening things because I never had enough pages. Um, but I was, I'm really struck by how consistent my vision was. Um, I love the journal, but I wanted to double down on the feminist commitments of the previous editors and build out some of my own. Um, I knew that high submissions were a real issue, and I also knew that Dana had done this amazing job of creating a very efficient ship. 
Um, one of the things I did was increase the number of deputy editors uh, to make it easier to share the burden. I got this all-star team, Mary Bernstein, Maxine Craig, Melissa Milkey, and Adia Wingfield, all scholars whose work I love could bring a different take either through their methods or their fields they covered um, and help you know, create that kind of wide um, supportive space. Uh, if there's anything I wish I had done differently, it's that I wish I had co-edited the journal. Um, I was on for four years. My family vacations always included gender and society. My kids were four and eight when I started editing, so that was a bit of a bummer. Um, I wanted to actively use the editorial board. I wanted to have people from different kinds of institutions, different scholarly traditions, different age cohorts. I wanted to like learn from lots of smart people. And um, as you'll see as I talk, I got all my ideas from them. <laughs> um, I also saw working with managing editors is key to the success. The UMass grad students that I worked with were diverse by gender, gender identity, race, method, and subfield. So Laura Heston, RJ Bar Barrios, Alisa Martinez, Cassandra Rodriguez, and Mihaela Dyer Stewart. I couldn't have done it without the deputy editors, the managing editors, the editorial board. Like my predecessors, I agree that mentoring was the key thing I wanted to do with the journal. Um, I had really clear ideas about how to give useful guidance to authors who we issued R&Rs to, um, and I really tried to follow through with that, continuing the central mentoring role that GMS always had. Um, I did have a few second rounds of R&Rs, but it was like less than 10. Um, because it was, you know, it's, you, you don't, I always talked about how I didn't want the paper to be watered down through the review process. I wanted it to remain its, you know, maintain its integrity, um, the author's vision. Um, I provided a lot of mentoring through the materials on Manuscript Central. I wanted to make the invisible rules of publishing visible. And I also wanted to provide reviewers with guidance about how to mentor authors rather than how to be mean. Um, so that was something that took a lot of time at the front end, but I still see signs about how these materials are being used, not just at Gender and Society, but other journals. I sometimes get it back. Um, I wanted to publish more work. Uh, we only had 960 pages. I was quite bitter that Science had 1,200, um, but I did thematize many of my issues like Beth and Christine. I did not distinguish between different kinds of articles. Um, they just were all Gender and Society articles. Um, and I was really grateful that we had this reasonable contract with SAGE, um, thanks to the work of Chris and, and many others to support the activities of a journal. Um, I, I really thought a lot about that desk reject or the deflect problem, which has, of course, gotten significantly worse for all journals in sociology. Um, and the way I really try to think about it the most was that some of the papers that came to Gender and Society would not be bettered by reviews from our reviewers because they really were not aimed at Gender and Society. So my goal was to try to mentor those authors and help them find what is the better place to send their, their article. How do they identify what the right place is to send their article? So I spent a lot of time identifying outlets for the work either that was deflected or the work that was rejected. Um, and, you know, I actually, there were lots of great articles that came to me that um, were not really appropriately theorizing gender that I, um, that I rejected or deflected. And they ended up in excellent journals. Like they, I, I said, you should send this to ASR. And then they would, and there it would be. So that still tickles me a lot that, uh, that you know, those, those pieces went on to have have the right, you know, the place in the sun they deserved. Uh, as a woman of color, a second generation immigrant, a disabled person, intersectional per scholar, intersectionality needed to remain central to the journal, of course, for me. Um, and I think because of the diversity of our editorial team, I heard a lot of rumors that I would only publish work focused on women of color. Um, and like Beth, my goal was to just help people understand that theorizing intersections doesn't mean just doing research on women of color. Um, my entry into the journal was a symposium on the work of Pat Hill Collins, and her work had saved my life in graduate school. Um, and I wanted to really continue with that. And you know what the other editors have talked about, like the important work on on sexuality, the important work that was bringing in that Dana published, especially on transgender um, gender identities and non-binary. These were things that I saw as really important to my um, editorship. Engaging with global sociology was also critical. Uh, intellectually, my research hasn't been really centered in the U.S., and I wanted to shake up the provincialism I saw in U.S. So sociology. I also knew that gender society was free in most global South countries, and so it was really being downloaded. It was being read outside of North America, and um, I really wanted to do something about that. 
uh, in practice, what I did was I combined the editorial board and the international editorial board into one body. And then I used my budget to bring in members from outside the US to every meeting so that people were really engaging with others from Ghana or Brazil or South Africa or Finland or India or Hong Kong or wherever. Um, and many of the best ideas we got came from those international members of the editorial board. Uh, like in Christine's case, special issues were a lot harder because pubs was quite worried. We were getting 600 <laughs> um, submissions a year, 550 submissions a year. And, you know, they didn't want us to then crowd them out. But I did do one special issue that was very transnational. It was with Orit Avishai, Afshan Jafar, and Rachel Ronaldo, scholars who had really thought about religion in many different locations. And we got more than 100 submissions. It brought submissions from around the globe. And again, I still see a lot of the papers that we had to reject appearing in excellent journals um, that really helped goose feminist analyses of religion uh, and agency transnationally. Um, like Chris, I realized that there were real issues with how reviewing of work outside the US was working. So people had this very kind of narrow version of what scholarship would look like. So I had a new practice where I tried to get one reviewer from a person's location and one reviewer from another location. So a US feminist scholar had to make their work about a US you know, location legible to a Ghanaian scholar as well as vice versa. So that was you know, meant to expose everybody to you know, sort of a larger sense of how scholarship is done and the review process at, at GNS. And it did have a handy impact of increasing uh, the likelihood of submitting to the journal. So if you ask people to, to um, review for you often, they're more likely to uh, actually submit things. Uh, I don't think that the practice has radically changed how much research we publish from outside the US. I do think that they made the research we published much more connected to the rest of the world. I failed in a number of ways. Um, one international board member suggested we publish abstracts in other languages to draw in reading, readers from other parts of the world. Uh, many academics in other parts of the world read English, but they won't necessarily browse gender and society. Um, and we chose French, Spanish, Portuguese, Bengali, Hindi, Mandarin, and Arabic and proposed it to pubs. It would have been about $15,000 a year and they did not agree. Um, I also wanted the journal to be more engaged with wider publics, policy movements, the press. We worked with the SWS press officer to highlight pieces in the media. We did that very successfully for some time. Uh, there were many different folks involved over the years that I was editing and some partnerships were more effective than others. Um, some of the stuff took off. English speaking work throughout the world was just everywhere. And the promotional work also converted into both downloads and citations. And I should say, should say since Dana mentioned citations, at the time that I was editing, uh, mostly, you know, thanks to her, gender society was usually ranked like fourth or sixth in US sociology journals um, because the citation rate was really high. Um, one of our international board members mentioned that newspaper articles appeared um, summarizing the findings of journal articles in India and translating this to the global scale. We just developed the Gender and Society blog, which under the leadership of managing editor Mihaela Dyer Stewart published about 100 pieces a year, not only highlighting gender and society articles, but feminist scholarship more generally. Um, while we were a little disappointed to learn that the blog was used more by students taking sociology courses than like the world, and that was visible because we saw how high the usage was during academic semesters. We still loved that feminist scholarship was getting wider readership and also on the recommendation of an ed board member, we developed gender and society in the classroom, highlighting articles that worked well in classroom settings for a bunch of different areas. Um, we also actively used social media and, you know, I don't really tweet or anything like that, but we did Facebook and Twitter and posting podcasts of interviews with authors and all of that seemed to draw people in. My hope, again, was that we could link to feminist movements. I had long conversations with feminist leaders of several key organizations. Uh, the truth is what they needed was very different from what gender and society could provide. They needed feminist sociologists to embed with their organizations, maybe during a sabbatical to carry out the research the organization needed to move forward its agenda. I proposed to SWS funding a sabbatical fellowship of that sort, but it didn't go really anywhere. I also supported Myra Marks Faree's proposal for a second journal more focused on feminist practitioners and praxis. My hope was that it was going to be named Gender and Praxis to signal siblinghood with gender and society, but sadly that failed as well. Um, like others, I grew to love line editing. My grad students are extremely annoyed by how much line editing I do. 
Uh, when I think about what I'm proud about, uh, we mentored a wide range of authors. We helped them find their own voice with their work. I still hear from authors I never published telling me about what they've recently been up to because they found our feedback helpful and have really maintained a long-term relationship with me. Um, I can't name names because there's no way to cover them all, but I'm really incredibly proud of the work that we did publish. So many of the offers that I had a chance to read, many of them still graduate students are the leading lights in the field today. I have really enjoyed continuing to read and follow the journal under Joe and Barbara. Gender and society will always be deeply important to me. Thanks to SWS for giving me the chance to reflect today on the four golden years that I edited the journal. <laughs> Thanks so much, Joya. That was great that you, I, seeing how things unfolded and grew has been just really great for me as one of the earlier editors. And I particularly appreciate how you added a lot more multimedia strategies than we had previously had. And I'm impressed with the efforts you made to increase our transnational readership and authorship, both in the changes in the boards and how you reached out and used in the reviewers. Really interesting strategies to hear about. So thank you. I'm going to move on to our eighth editor. I mean, it, you know how amazing it is to be a journal that's lasted this long and have nine still here editors. It's really great. So it's my pleasure to introduce the eighth editor, Joe Rieger at Oakland University in Michigan, whose term was 2015 to 2019. She's professor of sociology and chair of the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, Social Work and Criminal Justice. Her research focuses on the areas of gender, social movements, feminist theory, and qualitative methods. Jo has been chair of the ASA section on collective behavior and social movements at least twice that I counted. She is author of many articles and chapters as well as of the book, Everywhere and Nowhere, Contemporary Feminism in the United States. She has edited or co-edited four other volumes, most recently, Nevertheless, They Persisted, Feminisms, and continued resistance in the U.S. women's movement. It's my pleasure to welcome Joe Rieger to our forum. Well, first, let me say um, thank you. I'm so honored to be here. Um, I was honored to be um, an, an editor for Gender and Society, and, and part of me is still pinching myself that this all came true. Um, I want to say that I first started reading Gender and Society in graduate school, and Verda Taylor was my advisor, and Nancy Whittier was my colleague. And I recently, um, I've been working on a book about social movements and gender, and I went back to the two special editions that were published in Gender and Society, because it's one of the most um, comprehensive looks at gender and social movements. I also want to say that I published under Chris, and I was rejected under uh, Joya, <laughs> but I, uh, I forgave her. She was an amazing mentor for me, and, and really the reason I became editor is Joya reached out to me and suggested that I submit an application, and I did. So um, that was a, a just a, the beginning of a really great relationship with Joya, and I reached out to her and Dana often to ask advice or to get some, you know, just to get some help with how to think through some things that I was facing. So I'm very grateful to them and, and all of the editors that came before me. Um, I think when I think about my term, I'm going to repeat kind of what Chris said and, and, and Joya said, Christine said and Joya said. Um, one of my main goals was not to screw it up. I wanted the quality to continue. Um, it was so important to me to, um, to keep an eye on what the journal had been doing and what I could continue to um, contribute to it. I think when I think about what I did that was really different than any other and any other editor is that I'm at a, a regional public university with no graduate students. And so I was able to bring the journal here and um, I was able to hire, uh, we have, uh, there's a lot of um, people with PhDs that kind of are around universities looking for full-time work or unable to do full-time work. And so I had uh, managing editor staff that were um, two women who were PhDs who were looking for full-time work, and then two uh, Wayne State graduate students that I was able to connect to. So 
I, I thought that that was kind of an innovation in how we do the journal and it opens the doors for other types of universities to be the home. And I think that's important. Um, I think there's something about situated in a, a setting where I wasn't dealing with graduate students all the time. I was dealing with really undergraduates that made me think about the, the type of work we were doing in the journal. So I was, I was very proud of uh, being able to do that. Um, I'm also proud of the fact that when I think about what we did over the course of those three years, almost four years, because it's really half a year and another half a year, um, I, I, I love the team I worked with and everything we did, I felt like we were a team. I needed my deputy editors and my managing editors to copy. I had a copy editor, um, but I want to just say that Rachel Onwater, Krista Bromley, Melanie Hughes, and Amy Stone um, helped shape the journal just as much as I did. And each one of them had uh, a specialty that they could focus on, but they also were so good at um, you know, giving me feedback. And, and there were times when I sent stuff out for a review that they would push back on a little bit. They'd be like, I don't know if this is going to work. And I appreciated somebody else to help me think about what we were doing. So that was, that was so important important to me. Um, the managing editors, Jen Lendrum, she's now a professor at Aquinas, uh, Lacey Story, uh, Amanda Draft, who now works for RAND, and Beth Perre, who works at Oakland University. So the managing editors have also gone on to have um, some amazing careers too. So I appreciated this chance to work with an incredibly talented group of women. Um, so I think part of what I wanted to do is to uphold everything that, that everybody had started before. But a lot of the things that Joya had started, I wanted to keep going. I wanted to keep the blog going. I wanted to work on the social media. Um, I wanted to keep gender and society in the classroom. And so we started to, to um, revise it somewhat. And at times we, uh, in the fall, we would send it out on listservs that we knew we would get um, people putting it on their syllabus, encouraging it to get into the classroom, um, trying to break it into pieces. Like, are you teaching about immigration? Here's some great gender and society articles. So we tried to keep those, those um, ideas going, those initiatives going and make them really relevant. Um, I also tried to go everywhere I could, anytime anyone would let me and talk about how to publish in the journal. And I was able to do that all across the United States. I went to several different universities. Um, Katrine Zippel invited me and I got to talk to some of her graduate students, one of which um, ended up publishing a piece in Gender and Society. But I loved that interaction to talk about not only how to submit, but how to be a good reviewer. And um, I felt like even if they never were gonna do anything related to gender, it was so important that people know how to write a good review um, because nothing's more disappointing than waiting for somebody to finally tell you what they think about an article and you get a couple of sentences back or it's not useful. So how to, how to structure it and doing some of that kind of mentoring. Um, I was able to go to, um, I talked to students in Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand. So anytime I went anywhere, I was always like, do you have graduate students you'd like me to talk to? And I loved doing that portion of it. When I started, um, I did a symposium, my very first issue, called Theorizing Rape. Um, and it basically, we, we invited, I invited a, a, a range of scholars, Pat Martin, Nancy Whittier, uh, Mike Mesner, CJ Pasco, Kristen Barber, among others, to kind of think about how we were talking about um, rape and thinking about, theoretically thinking about rape and sexual assault. And one of the things that I am um, really pleased about is towards the end of my term, I saw that um, people were starting to cite those articles and they were, uh, they, those, those pieces, they were really just kind of essays, but those started to kind of prompt some people to think about issues about sexual assault and rape in um, new and interesting ways. And so um, I was very pleased to have done that. The other special issue that I did uh, with Nancy Naples, uh, Laura Malden, and Heather Dilway was on um, gender, uh, disability, and intersectionality. And, and that was a really interesting process because I think disability studies and gender studies and intersectionality studies really hadn't been talking to each other and desperately needed to. 
Um, and so we did get a lot of, we didn't get a ton of articles for that, not like what happened with Joya when she did Gender and Religion, but what we did get were some really core, interesting, important articles that I think are going to be used by scholars for years to come. And so I really applaud Nancy, Laura, and Heather for the work that they did on that and just uh, the way in which we, they were able to put together something that I think is going to have a lot of value that people will uh, refer to. Um, in terms of my focus, uh, I really, I, I wanted, I think, I think it was Christine who said she wanted stuff with sparkle, <laughs> something that would spark a little. I always was so interested in people who took a little, little different look at it. And there were articles that I just so fell in love with that some of them got published, some of them didn't get published, but I just loved it when we got people who were taking things and pushing it in a new direction. And so I was always willing to you know, maybe it didn't have the highest number, you know, the highest end count, but I, or, you know, they were using theory in a little different way. I was always so interested in, in trying to see where we could get those. And sometimes I did give second R&Rs because I was really hoping we could make things work. And so I, I hope uh, people out there will forgive me for that <laughs> if they felt that that was a horrible process. But sometimes stuff was so close and you just knew if you could just help it get a little farther, it would, it would succeed. I was always interested in helping emergent scholars, um, graduate students, people who are trying to do new and interesting things. And so um, some of the articles that we published, I'm really proud of. Some of them I inherited from Joya, but there were some that came through that I thought were just, um, these were people who were going to be very important in the field. And I think that's turned out to be correct. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges I had was just the sheer number of dust rejects. And I, I, Dana alluded to this. When it went online um, and you could submit online, there were so many articles we got that had nothing relevant whatsoever to the journal, you know. And so that, that was difficult. I also was the editor that had during the, I don't know if you all remember the fake paper schedule, the scandal where the people it was the group of people who made up all these articles and submitted them. Um, Gender and Society got two. We just rejected one. The other one we sent out because we thought it was by a graduate student who needed some advice and got a very nice mentoring letter back about how we couldn't publish it. So I was really proud of the way we came out of that. We came out as kind. Um, so I think I'll conclude just by saying that I think my overall ethos was to be as kind to people as possible to um, uphold the traditions of the editors before me, to show the kind of kindness that I had been shown by the, the people that the editors I had worked with. And so I was so very honored to um, have had this opportunity. So thank you. Thanks, Joe. That was great. I uh, really appreciate that. We are now up to our ninth and current and last editor. And I note that we have pretty much absorbed most of our time, so there may not be a lot of chance to talk afterwards. However, if you've been watching your screen, there have been lots of chatting about <laughs> the usefulness or not of um, second reviews, as well as compliments to various editors as we move along. So I've been glad to see that and feel free to keep chatting because that's mostly what we're gonna get to do. So I'm not gonna use up, um, any more of Barbara's time. And I'm going to move on to Barbara Risman, our current Gender and Society editor, who's at the University of Illinois at Chicago and is professor and head, I believe head of sociology. No more, uh, nope, no more head. Oh good, I'm glad you gave that up because you wouldn't have time. Um, <laughs> and she has been president of SWS, SWS feminist lecturer, She's received the SWS Feminist Mentoring Award. She's been Vice President of the ASA, Editor of Contemporary Sociology, President of the Southern Sociological Society, and received the ASA Award for Public Understanding of Sociology. She is, is also, one, or perhaps was, uh, President of the Board of CCF, the Council on Contemporary Families. Her research is in the area of gender inequality in families, feminist activism, and public sociology. And among her many publications, she's author of Gender Vertigo, of uh, American Families in Transition, Families as They Really Are, and Where the Millennials Will Take Us. So now I turn it over to you, Barbara, to tell us where you're gonna take gender and society. 
Okay, well, um, hopefully you can hear me because I can't see anybody. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank those of you who organized this meeting. It's been a really fascinating uh, to listen to the editors who came before me. Uh, and I just want to say that I'm, I feel incredibly lucky. I took over a journal that was running smoothly, highly cited, is kind of a feminist legacy, and it's well-resourced to boot. So what more could anyone ask for as they go into an editorship? Um, and I clearly stand on the shoulder of giants, and I'm, I know that even more uh, listening to everyone's stories. Uh, so as Judith mentioned, gender and society was very important to my own career. So I don't know if Judith remembers this, but uh, how much I ended up publishing the first article in the first journal was because I had an R&R &R at Signs from my dissertation, and it was on men and mothering, and it was a quantitative analysis, and Signs had wanted me to somehow take out the numbers from my revision. Uh, and I met Judith at an SWS, what was then called Midyear Meetings, and I asked for advice on how can I do that? How can I present my data from a regression analysis without any numbers? What this shows you is there really wasn't a place for feminist theology. She told me to send her the article, and she wrote back and urged me to withdraw it from signs and send it to this new journal she was founding. And I did. And I do think that it was really important because the gender journals, um, this was in 1986 or something, um, were interdisciplinary, but they weren't necessarily open to social science per se. So... Oh, I just sort of wanted to say that and say how important gender and society has been throughout my whole career, as, of course, has SWS. Um, I also want to say that my editorial style, like Joe's, is really very much teamwork. My managing editors, Cheryl Skaggs, Irma Moirisi, Ann Tavers, Christine Myers, and Smitha Rodrik-Shanan are like a team. We talk over any kind of decision that happens, and I want to start by thanking them. Um, so what a, I inherited a journal which has absolutely no struggle, and so I have the luxury of being able to look at new goals. Uh, but as I listen, I hear that my new goals aren't really new. They're just building on other people's goals and, and strengths. Um, one of my first goals is following several other people is to try to make the journal more international. But I think that the efforts of former editors and Julia in particular have really paid off because I don't have to struggle in quite the same way um, to try to do this. I'm really happy that our next issue is actually written all by women of color and it's all about countries beyond the United States, beyond our borders, and that just happened. It just happened as I started uh, accepting articles, I realized there were enough there to do it. And so I'm going to continue to try to do that. We, have, uh, we still have the editorial board that has members from other countries, and I've tried to increase that as well. I continue to try to um, have someone from the country of origin if I'm reviewing something from another place. Uh, I will also say, very honestly, that when it comes to desk rejects, it is the rate of desk rejects is much higher for international um, articles than for others. It many partly is they're not in the kind of style that we expect that looked like a social science journal that uh, is, Amer is published in our country. Uh, but I'm working on more of that. Another goal that I think is kind of uh, probably surprising to some of you, but I find that I have, uh, it, we're kind of underrepresenting any kind of quantitative work on gender these days. Anecdotal, anecdotal evidence tells me we're not seen as a welcoming journal for people who use numbers, and our submissions seem to reflect that. Um, in addition, I find it, I personally find it far more difficult to find appropriate quantitative researchers than qualitative ones uh, in our database and otherwise. I just think our community. Uh, isn't broad and deep. And so I have nominated some more strong quantitative feminists to be on the board um, in the future. Um, so what I really think I'm trying that is new and a little bit different is I have a student editorial board. 
and the student editorial board uh, first started to be with a local group, uh, and we met twice a semester. Uh, it is now international because once we went online with the pandemic, we realized we didn't have to just be local. We could let editorial board members nominate students from all around the world. So what they they started by just sort of updating a little bit that wonderful in the classroom project that has already existed. And then we moved on to doing something totally different that we are going to um, we're going to highlight in the next week and roll out. And that's a new section called teaching modules. And in it, an individual student advisory board member or groups of them have chosen gender and society articles and made whole teaching modules around them with videos and other readings and something you can drop in to teach in a classroom. And so I, they're also reviewed, they're both reviewed by the author of the original article and also by one member of the editorial board. So watch for that, that's coming soon. We've also taken over the um, podcasting from uh, SAGE so that the teams of the student editorial board members are doing that. Our managing editors are graduate students and they are working way beyond uh, capacity. Seth Berhan, June Mason, and Marian Vega organize everything done by the student editorial board and the whole pedagogy project and the podcast and the blogs. Um, it's really quite amazing what they are doing. Operationally, we still have a commitment to feminist mentoring. I have tried to decrease the number of guests, reject some, anything I, and I have, and our numbers show that what that means is our reject let, went up a little and our guest reject went down, but those people are getting um, some reviews. Um, I do line edit every manuscript, and uh, I hope people don't think I'm too invasive, but I too want sparkling articles. Before it goes to a copy editor, I do line edit everything. I line edit every blog, which is almost more work because I don't want jargon in it, and that's really hard for sociologists. Um, I'm trying really hard to do public sociology. I don't know how well I will succeed. Um, we put out one press release, but without any SWS press person on the books these days, I had to do it myself and it took an inordinate amount of time. And so we're gonna hold off on those until at least after the pandemic, which brings us to the pandemic and what it's doing to gender in society. Unlike what I read from other editors and their own blogs and tweets, our manuscript numbers are not decreasing. They're increasing. At this rate, we will have over 700 um, during this year, which is will be up uh, quite a lot from last year. So what is happening, however, is though our wonderful reviewers are overwhelmed and I have to ask three times as many reviewers for every review. And almost most of the reviewers ask for extensions and our R&Rs are coming back very, very late. And so like the rest of the world, we're kind of slowing down and I don't think there's anything to be done about it. I give, re I give absolute extensions to anyone who asks for anything during this pandemic um, and we'll see what happens. So far, we're still publishing on time, but if we have to slow down a little uh, a month or so and be late, we will because our, our authors and our reviewers are under tremendous uh, burden. So I will end by saying, all well with gender and society, and we look forward to building strength, coming from strength. And I'm really humbled to be following in the footsteps of the amazing editors who came before me. Thanks so much, Barbara. I appreciate the update, and it helps us all know what's going on and whether or not we should submit, review, etc. Technically, our time is up, and most of our discussion has happened via chatting, which I imagine everybody but Barbara has been able to to read, yeah. <laughs> for which I apologize. Most of the discussion has been on second review, RVRs uh, or r and rs depending on what you call them. That's also a lot of compliments to, uh, to, to the session. Uh, I, Josephine, if you're still there, do you want to wrap up or is that my job? Okay, she's not there. 
So I want to thank everybody for attending. It's, it's, no, I'm here, but it's your job. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, so it's my job and I will wrap up. I want to thank all the editors. This has been an amazing discussion, even as an editor. I have learned things about how we interfaced with each other and who picked up from whom and what kinds of changes we've instituted that has only made it a better and more impactful and more intersectional and more transnational journal. It's been a really great discussion. I'm glad to see that it's being recorded so that other people can hear it. And I want to thank you all for participating and all the other people who have been clearly chatting and online. I think I saw 46 people involved at least last time I looked. So thank you so much. And may we continue being as great a journal as we have, no matter where our resources take us. Thank you to everybody. It's been a pleasure. Bye, -bye. I'm Bye everybody. Bye. Yes. Thank you to everybody. everybody.